It would be a shame to begin this essay in any manner whatsoever. I could begin with a dictionary definition. Tacky. A story. Too many already. A catchy hook. Are there any of those anymore? It is as if all is too predictable. Even lamenting about the lack of adequately unique ways to begin an essay is pitiful in a sense. Like beginning an essay on society by invoking Merriam-Webster. Have we any originality left? This lamentation is all too noticeable today when the ancients who still walk the streets with the assistance of chunks of steel and tennis balls proclaim the death of society to have passed. Theorists and philosophers today, what is there left to talk about that would not be all too predictable? Part of an interplay of illusory discourse masquerading as intellectual prowess. Even a child could do these things. Are we not then all children, prancing through the political, offering useless attempts to get out from under the authority of father's leather belt, offering useless alternatives to something we'll understand when we're older, and sobbing, lathering ourselves in our own puddles of snot and tears that are Kalachnikovs, C4, bomb-filled vests, and even planes? Everything can be interpreted as a method of control to the child, and father and mother are the symbolic order under which all actions meet their final judgment. Divinity changes its tactics from fire and brimstone to spoonfuls of vinegar, thorny twigs, and scolding, although even Jehovah knew how to do the latter. The child watches adult passers-by doing their cell phone calls, paying bills, driving cars, and making decisions, and all at once yearns to grow up. Revolutionary action is taken to escape this genetic subterfuge, learning to use the potty, going off to school, and making friends all to escape into concentric circles of domination like that of an infinitely cascading kaleidoscope. The child finds that one day those reins are gone, though. God triumphed over, strange how I remember God changing my diapers and swaddling me in blankets, and the symbolic order surpassed only to find more. Has all this revolution collapsed on itself? Mother and father remain sat atop their thrones with their gifts from years past now sitting upon one's bookshelves like idols, emanating spiritual bile. One cannot help but look upon the course of one's own history as if it were being followed like a cookbook, step by step. Why two teaspoons of oregano? That, my friend, has already been decided. Why this town of origin or that one? Why a public school? Why these linens? That, my friend, is far worse. That has never been decided. A quick step back shows that these choices are not made by anybody, but precisely the kind of thing nobody makes, or everybody. Little choices, prepackaged like an Amazon package containing your meals for the next week, sitting in front of you and in front of us, waiting to be unpackaged. We see through these wares. We can't quite remember when we ordered this package, but it's too pretty not to open. Myth exists, but one must guard against thinking that all people believe in it. So goes the anthem of our time of Amazon, UPS, USPS, DHL, FedEx, etc. Is this cascade of acronyms not enough to prove that we are too far gone? What is one to make of this phantasm of authenticity? How is one to act as an adult, knowing that each step backward of widening one's perspective and seeing through the system is merely an altering of one's perspective, not the surpassing of it? One can take a step backward, whether it be from terror or fascination, but one merely finds themselves presented with a new list of information, of things that just are. It is not so much that one cannot grasp things anymore, that we must go back to Descartes, that methodological ontologician, and raise everything to the ground and begin again from the original foundations if I wanted to establish anything firm and lasting, but rather that one merely is a grasper of things. There are no longer non-things. Fictions permeate our reality, that of voting, producing, deciding, speaking, participating, playing the game, a form of blackmail and ultimatum just as serious as the other, even more serious today. How many of us can point to voting as an authentic expression of the people? Certainly it seems that we are presented with such a gift of power, like a gleaming scepter that may pierce through the ruse of democracy in the world, but can one really see this as power? 
Is it not instead that one's voting power, at least in the American setting, the only one of whom I feel informed enough to offer substance with regard to, is merely a promise of power, like that of an arms trading agreement, but whose weapons the recipient never receives? One is made aware, almost without asking to be so, of a faulty system of old men, drone strikes, hookers, and protecting freedom and democracy. The latter is of the most surreptitiously malevolent nature of all. One might as well say, I am a terrorist, but for the right reasons, and you ought to like them. All of these faults are laid at our feet, and we are told of a utopian day whence our goals will be reached and our vote will see itself valuable. One is sold voting to the extent that it might as well be a method of revolution, like neo-Nazi groups who use their rights given by the founding fathers to create a citizen's militia, as if any father would be so dumb as to offer the scepter by which to cut his own Gordian knot of authority. Can we really be so foolish as to believe our captor when they offer us the open door to freedom and cut loose our shackles? Is this not the preamble to some greater form of suffering? A lifelong bounty on one's head, permanent anxiety of the captor's return, a lure to give a false confession, the end itself masquerading as the beginning? I, for one, cannot be so sure of the benevolence of old men and their harems of freedom. Is this sexual relationship between these men and their beloved freedom not precisely the thing we should be concerned about, a possible sign of manipulation on the part of that poor, captive woman freedom? What purpose does revolution serve today? Utility, assimilation, complacency, radical subversion, victory? Are all of these true? None? Does it serve some way to escape the order of things? or a way to show that we now only live in the disorder of things? Does terrorism subvert or confirm, scare or soothe? Can we really even take a stance anymore when an opinion stands in the void prepackaged for us? Surely one cannot attribute an alternative synonym by which to refer to terrorism, subversion, meaningful revolution, defying expectations, etc., without being confronted by 9-11 in all its terror. Not just in the event, but also in the way the media salivated over this breaking news. Can we meaningfully mince and bowl over its meaning if there is no longer meaningful subversion? One feels dirty even offering an alternative theory of terrorism. The word itself has been constructed with such vile sounds so as to erect this edifice of surety. It is as if one had put on a bomb-filled vest and shouted Quranic recitations by even swaying from that which is obviously already so. Has terrorism, and revolution writ large, lost all possible meaning, not by it not being thus, but by being beyond sensible discourse? If so, all those who see despair, illusion, and manipulation, all those who seek to go beyond, must sigh in defeat at the death of all political, and possibly all in general, meaning. Shall we call for a rejoicing of terrorism? Lament? Some sort of comical turn of signs in the hope of reinvigorating a lost order of meaning and non-meaning, stability and subversion? Shall we all strap on bomb-filled vests of rhetorical shrapnel, hijack planes of progress, or kidnap intellectual dissidents, or even strip the analogy, all in the hopes of regaining some lost divine referential? No, that will not do. No, not at all. One must simply... One cannot fault the terrorist for reaching such a plane of existence, one of disgust for the infidels, of pity for their fellow sorrowful citizens who sit in the hopes that death would find them first. Has not every person found this door beckoning their reply? Shall one be called living without it? All of these social, political, and economic vicissitudes are enough to make one fall to their knees from vertigo, and we may very well be at fault. Bin Laden, John Wilkes Booth, and Trump, all are our creations. Is it not those of the same races as us who manned the news stations in eager anticipation of breaking news as those two towers fell, one of meaning, the other of reality, and we all instantly knew that Boltoyad was right. The masses are the increasingly dense sphere in which the whole social comes to be imploded and to be devoured in an uninterrupted process of simulation. The onslaught is the only act the masses can produce as such a projectile mass that challenges the edifice of mass culture, 
that Whitley replies with its weight, that is to say, with the characteristic most deprived of meaning, the stupidest, the least cultural one they possess, to the challenge of culturality thrown at it by Buborg. It is in a moment of hand-tossing that the terrorist mounts their camel, their Toyota, their Wi-Fi. Anything will do, if only to deliver us beyond. For bin Laden, it was the hereafter to which he sought to be flung. Are not all of us, then, a suicide bomber, hurling ourselves toward that light that beckons us? Maybe it was for this reason that Gaddafi dissented against democracy. What has it gotten us in the U.S.? The Vietnam War, that wretched fever dream of a hoax, of bloodthirsty, psychotic dreams of mutilation, brought to the fore overnight in the jungles of... of wait, you can't even find it on a map? A bad apple. So says those who still hold out hopes for the legitimacy of democracy in America and the world, for that matter, whilst standing frozen like a tombstone at the sight of the greatest political opposition to any action of the 20th century against this war, epitomized in May of 1968 in France. Can we really say that the people speak louder than those who scream at us to put down our weapons and get back to producing their Kalashnikovs? Their AK-47s by which our earth crumbles under the tears of mothers and fathers? It is likely that Nietzsche was the first theorist of terrorism. Let me repeat, this depressing and contagious instinct, pity, stands against all those instincts which work for the preservation and enhancement of life. In this role of protector of the miserable, it is a prime agent in the promotion of decadence. Pity persuades to extinction. A force, one doesn't say extinction, one says the other world, or God, or the true life, or nirvana, salvation, blessedness. Nevertheless, this philosophy is just as polarizing as the left, abortion, or pineapple on pizza today, and as such it has been relegated to academia alone, pushing itself into the public eye only enough to see the potential birth pangs of Nazism in its infantility without stopping long enough to see Nietzsche's eagle and Übermensch. Today I stand struggling to end such a text, not because I have nothing left to say, but precisely because I have things to say. I could tell you about hope or despair, political opinions or objective news, or say some mundane thing with the aid of gaudy syntax and diction. Would any of this be foreign? Like watching a kid's movie as an adult, everything is predictable. Even that which is unpredictable is consumed under the edifice of being part of the predictability. Plot twists are reduced to the parent who knows it all and sees above the ruse of a mere animated show with green ogres and talking donkeys, as if the latter element wasn't itself native to their biblical treasures that are held so close. It is at once that I end here, not to give any substance, but precisely to lay bare that my river of substance has run dry, seeing as I find myself evaporating in the crisp sun of the eye of the reader, who burns a hole through me as if to discover below my skin. Alas, I am just skin. Skin touching buttons, buttons touching mechanical actuators, actuators playing their part in the divine machine of the computer, acting and reacting like man's new best friend. Here ends Skin's journey as it goes beyond, not to the hereafter, but to the now in hopes of some more nows.